This is the seventh session of the Class in Social Organization. Tonight we're on lecture 13 and 14 in the syllabus, beginning on page 50. Before we begin our class session tonight, let's bow together in prayer. Our gracious Father in heaven, we come to you tonight and we again acknowledge that you are the creator of all things. And Lord, that you have made us and given us the capacity for cultural life and spiritual life. Lord, especially we recognize that you've made us to have a relationship with you. And so, Lord, we ask as we come tonight to study once again the dimensions of social life and culture and society, that you would keep reminding us as we reflect on your scripture and as we reflect on the cases that we have before us of what it means to be different, to be followers of Jesus Christ and participants in the kingdom of God. We thank you, Lord, that your kingdom is not of this world, but we also thank you that you came into this world to change it and transform it into your own likeness. So, Lord, we commit this time to you and we ask your direction. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. As we begin tonight with Lecture 13, we're going to look at the subject of political and social power. Uh, in your reading for tonight, there were a number of different uh, articles and uh, chapters that you were assigned that focus on this particular issue. And you may remember uh, John Ape's case study of leadership among the Igala. Uh, that particular case is one that we'll reflect on just a little bit in the opening of our lecture tonight. And then uh, I talked to you a few weeks ago about the Daini Indians in Brazil uh, will consider their particular leadership situation and uh, we'll also reflect on the people of Israel and leadership, particularly at the time of Ruth, in the second part of our lecture this, after, this evening. First question we want to ask as we look at community authority and power is, is leadership in the community in which you're working characterized by aggregation or centralization? Those particular terms are terms that um, I should define briefly. Aggregation uh, means people just together uh, in an unorganized collection, uh, as opposed to centralization means people who are brought together under some central direction and leadership. If I can uh, illustrate it for you this way, this particular class is a group of people that probably didn't have a relationship with one another before we had this course. In other words, you came to Biola, you were a student, you may be here for your first semester, and uh, you signed up for this course because someone advised you to do it. So you've come here and you have sat through this class, now we're in the seventh week of the semester, and um, you constitute a group that really is an aggregate of people. You have no previous identity, you have no previous connections with each other, uh, you've come together for a special purpose, the purpose of taking this course. So in this situation, leadership really is, you're an aggregate bunch and I am the teacher in the class and I'm providing leadership for this class on the basis of the fact that you made a contract with Biola and with me to take the class. And you have no contract relationship with other people. Now a situation of centralization is quite different because in centralization, you generally have people having some kind of contractual relationship with one another. They participate together in some common community kind of enterprise and activity. And the leaders uh, have been appointed, elected, or inherited uh, to have authority over those particular people. As we think about the Igala case study that John Ape described in the chapter for this evening, uh, John talks about kings and chiefs and officials that are part of the Igala social system. And if you remember, uh, well, let me ask you, how does the king get his job? Is he elected? Do you remember, Peter? In the end, they were really appointed by the government. Don't okay. Me. All right. You had a government authority who has some particular authority, uh, yeah, actually appoints certain officials to represent them in this situation. And so that's a very important part of the dynamic. The government has its own interest and appoints people to be in, in a authority there. Um, what about um, other avenues? Jane? The old, I think the oldest male was appointed leader of a Okay, all right. The oldest male having leadership in reference to a particular kind of clan. 
And so there are certain kinds of systems that are embedded within the structure. Uh, and those systems basically then decide who is going to be the leader and how that leader would function. If you remember the case study of the Dani Indians that I shared with you a few weeks ago, I told you that there were two chiefs in this particular village. Now, it was a very small village of 86 people. They didn't need two chiefs. And if you remember, I asked the question, well, why do you have two? And they said, well, uh, Itselawa came home and said he wanted to be chief. And we talked about it. And we said, well, no problem having two chiefs, so let him be chief too. And so they had two, because the chief really didn't have any particular uh, authority. The chief was more like a person who kind of encouraged people to have feast days together. And if Excello wanted, Excello wanted to have a feast with them and Napizza was going to have a feast, well, they liked having <laughs> feasts as often as possible, so it didn't matter to them. Uh, it really was not a role conflict. It wasn't a rivalry for power. It basically was, hey, here are two guys. They both want to help us by having feasts, so why not? It was kind of an open position. So the difference then between the Igala system and the Dani system is that the Dani system is really aggregate. And they'll take anybody who's willing to take the responsibility of leading them uh, as long as he does what they like. And if he doesn't do what they like, they leave, and they go somewhere else. In other words, there's no loyalty, there's no long-term term connection. It's basically, we like you or we don't like you. And if we don't like you, we're out of here. Uh, whereas the centralized systems are ones in which there's some permanency to them, there's cohesion. The, the, the uh, Igala lineage has an elderly person who is the head man of that lineage because the lineage itself has some cohesion. The Igala people have chiefs that are appointed by government officials because the government needs somebody to represent them and to take their uh, charges and their responsibilities in the local community. So with those kind of things, you have then a centralized system that operates to basically keep leadership at work in that society. Second question we ask is about political unity. Is political unity characterized by fragmented factions or coordinated institutions? Again, we're looking at uh, the basic features of the society. The business of um, aggregation or centralization focuses on the degree of coordinated hierarchy within a community, whereas this one focuses on the commitment to people, to other people in terms of some kind of group cohesion. So as we look at a society, to what extent is it fragmented and factional, or to what extent is it com committed to full group and cohesive group kinds of interactions and commitments. Uh, in India, political parties are characterized by their factional uh, characteristics. Uh, the, the nation of India is a huge nation. There are millions of people there. And the, the kind of political process that they have is characterized by a lot of divisions and factions and rivalries. And uh, it's one of those situations very hard to bring unity together uh, in this factional kind of situation. Now, there are certain kinds of unities that do exist. For example, there are strong religious oppositions that exist in India. You have Islam, and you have Hinduism, and you have Christianity. And sometimes people who identify with any one of these can be very vehemently opposed to people from the other groups. But within their own groups, they continue to break up in factions. They don't have strong cohesion in reference to the unity that binds them all together, unless it's against the Muslims or against the Christians. Uh, the, the type of national political system that you have is characterized by all kinds of factions and political parties. Anthropologists have done quite a bit of studying of political process in India. And uh, one of the key features they've noted in this is this building of alliances around a powerful person. The person is the one who is persuasive, and so people join up because of this person. Uh, and then when this person gets weak, they leave, and they go to another person who is powerful, the other person then drawing their alliances. And so that the cohesion is not based upon belonging. It's rather based upon, I like that person. I'm going to follow that person. And it creates this factional kind of division. In contrast to this, uh, you have in the Igala situation the clans and the villages. And they're existing organizations that outlive the life of any leader. And people uh, 
won't follow a leader from another clan. They really, their clan identity is more important to them than some charismatic leader. And so uh, in the Igala situation, coordinated institutions, the clan and the village become very important parts of their culture and their society. We could also contrast that with the um, political process here in the United States. The political process in the United States is really quite stable. Uh, there are a lot of small parties, but they're very small and they're very insignificant. Uh, the two major parties that have governed here in America for, since Abraham Lincoln are the Republican and the Democratic parties. And they have consistently operated over a period where they get factions within them sometimes. Uh, and that sometimes those factions can be divisive and cause them to lose elections. But uh, if they're able to pull people together in the cohesive unity, then they become very powerful. And they become a dynamic, powerful political force. Uh, probably the most significant recent emergence of factionalism in America was when Ross Perot ran in the presidential election uh, in which George Bush was defeated. Uh, that particular election, uh, there was a third group that created a large enough dissident group that the, neither of the two traditional political parties were able to sustain the kind of electoral power they had before. But truly, all of those groups uh, can have some factions within them. And yet what has typified American political life over the past century has been these groups working together uh, fairly cohesively over a long period of time and maintaining their political power. All right, well, enough of that. It just gives you a, an understanding that there are different characteristics of leadership that you're going to find in communities. And as you look at communities, you may find that they are fragmented and factional. You may find that they are... Uh, completely without structure in terms of hierarchy, or you may find that they have both strong group and, and hierarchy that, that motivate them and power them. Later on in the lecture, I'll come to our uh, summary of this in the four frames that you have in Agents of Transformation, but at this particular point, let's go on. As we think about decisions that are made, uh, sometimes uh, people make decisions by use, uh, u utilizing channels uh, and uh, working through the structure. The, the structure here at Biola University is one where you have president, you have vice presidents, you have then deans and directors, and then you have department chairpersons and things like that happening. It's a hierarchical structure. That particular structure is one where you're supposed to use proper channels. It's institutionalized in how you work. Whereas a network type of structure is one in which you have relationships with people. And you get things done by relationships, not by proper channel. And so there are social situations that you're going to be exploring that may have one or another of these things. For example, I would guess that the, the, uh, the structure at Cal State Fullerton through which James first got permission to do his research project was a hierarchical one. Uh, and that the hierarchy had sometimes made decisions about what uh, you could do through their international student group. Whereas um, you could walk onto that campus and approach international students through networks, uh, not through the hierarchy. You have two avenues of approach. One is to go through the institution itself and through the channels that are there. The other is to go through networks of relationships that exist within that same <coughs> setting. Now, as as you think about ministry strategies and you think about uh, doing research and trying to understand how a community works, you'll find there are both channels and networks that you can use for ministry. Uh, you have to ask yourself then, what is the cost of using a channel and what is the cost of using a network? What are the benefits of a channel? What are the benefits of a network? In some situations, like the Daini in Brazil, there are no channels. There are only networks. The chief really doesn't have any authority, and so you, you work with networks alone. Uh, in situations like the Cal State University in Fullerton, there are both channels and networks that you can work with, and so you have to decide which is the best avenue for you to approach uh, your particular ministry strategy in that context. I can tell you that uh, the typical secular university in America, the channels don't want you to do anything that's religious. Uh, they have very strong feelings about the separation of religion from any kind of formal state institutional life. So the best way to handle religious interests and activities in that context is through personal networks. 
So you'd have to ask yourself, how then can I build a ministry through networking of relationships as opposed to through channels? Because the channels will, will stop you. Um, actually, that could be true here in Biola as well. For example, if uh, a group of Mormons came and asked me, could they do evangelism on Biola's campus? I would say no. <laughs> that uh, we weren't going to give them permission to do that here. Uh, now, if they just networked, I really couldn't stop them. In other words, if they walked on campus and said, hi, James, uh, let's go out and have a cup of coffee. And uh, if either one of the Jameses said, fine, <laughs> there's no recourse to that. In other words, uh, we're not going to throw them off campus because they're human beings that we need to treat with respect. And so uh, it's that kind of a situation is you can see then the difference between using a channel uh, and getting formal permission or using a network to have relationships with others. Okay, the second thing we look at is the priorities that are in, uh, in, in uh, vogue in the society. To what extent are priorities given to uh, personal relationships and to what extent are they given to the protection of rights? Uh, again, these things follow the same kind of pattern we looked at before. If group is very important, personal relationships tend to be valued as well. Whereas if the individual is most important, then individual rights and protection of rights becomes more important than group values. And so, once again, we're looking at to what degree do people value group and to what degree do they value individuals. As I said, if group is very important, then relationships are going to be more important than individual rights. I had a conversation with some of the uh, resident directors here at Biola, and I asked them the question, what do Biola students value? And one of them said, oh, one of the most important themes here is individual rights, my rights, my uh, right to play loud music, my right to uh, stay up as late as I want, uh, my right to uh, eat uh, where I please. Those kind of things were things that are important to the students here. Well, it reflects an individualistic oriented culture as opposed to a culture like the one James came from where the group is very important and uh, James uh, doesn't question the fact that uh, the kitchen belongs to his mother. Uh, he doesn't question the fact that uh, when his father comes, the cooking starts as he starts across the way. Uh, and uh, James's mother doesn't talk about her rights. She talks about the expectations of the community and will she be uh, valued and, and respected within the community because she fulfills the roles and duties that she has in that area. So the rights of the group are very important in that context. When James returns home, all of those people are going to expect him to bring gifts. They'll expect him to bring money. They'll think he got rich here in America, and he, he certainly didn't. But if he doesn't bring something, he's in trouble, right, James? Correct. A lot of in fact, uh, uh, last week you had a little situation like that, James. Why don't you tell us about that? Uh, okay. If you'll come up here... Uh, I think this is worthwhile. Uh, you had a visitor before class last week, and you were late. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I'll put it on for you. Uh, tell us what happened and why you were late. Um, last week I was late because uh, a man from Kenya uh, had come to my house to tell me that a brother, now a brother in, in, uh, in Quartz, uh, who lives in, um, in Sacramento, had his in-law father die. And so he was coming to collect some money so that we may help him go to Kenya um, on a plane. And um, so he came and he was explaining to me, you know, this is what we do as a community. This is our tribe. This is our clan. Okay. And uh, I needed money. He seems to be the one that is coordinating this. I had no objections. So I went into my uh, checkbook and wrote him some money and told him, thank you, I've got to go to Biola. Uh, which means um, that there are some responsibilities and ob obligations that we don't un ask any question if it uh, belongs to one of us as a group. And uh, if you are in a situation and uh, somebody says, this is one of us, doesn't matter whether you had food or not, you must do something because it relates to one 
of us. Now, is he part of your clan? Yes, he, he is an Akamba, yes. Okay, an Akamba. But yes. what about your local clan? Is he from your local? No, no, he's no. not he's not close. Okay, not close. But since we are here in okay. the foreign land, okay. and we have few, we can still pull together okay. from the eastern coast to the western coast. And this is Sacramento, and I, yeah. I did not know the man. So he's the same language group as you, but yes. you never knew him before. Yes, I never knew him before, but uh, this man who is by the name Dwiko comes and says, we need to do something to help him. Okay. And I said, oh, yes. And when my in-laws, again, uh, send me something uh, uh, asking me to help them with their hospitalization bill, I did the same. Okay. So. This is highly reciprocal. Okay. Uh, that's really, that's what I want you to see in this, that when, we ha when you have these relationships, to even just the Akamba language group, when you're in a place like America, then you're in a foreign area, you turn to one another for help. You can just hang it on the tree there. And uh, that uh, is part of belonging, and that's how important belonging is to them. Now, our individualism here in America, one of the things that international students notice when they come here, and most of you are international, so uh, you can laugh at the Julie and I here, but uh, Americans get food and they eat it all by themselves. They don't share it. They don't offer anybody else any. They just eat themselves. Uh, and for most of you coming from other places, this is just very effective you know, <laughs> amazing, <laughs> and sometimes offensive, but they at least should offer, you know, that, uh, that, but we don't, because of the individualism that's pervasive in our culture here, we tend to think, well, your responsibility to get your own food, yeah. my responsibility to get mine, and that's what my father taught me. In other words, I shouldn't depend upon him, I shouldn't depend on anybody else, if I'm hungry, I get it myself. Well, uh, as James shared, in the group context from which he comes, those group obligations are much stronger, and the whole notion of sharing is a much more pervasive part of their lives. All right, um, let's go on. I'm going to now go to the case study of Ruth in chapter four, and we're going to be looking at the community authority, actually, in the book of Ruth. Uh, so far, we've been looking at the family structure and the ties that are there. Uh, as we look at this particular case tonight, we're going to focus on community authority. Before I do that, I'd like to just review briefly what we've had in the story. If you remember, in chapter 1, uh, the Naomi said, the Lord's hand is against me. Uh, and uh, Ruth said to Naomi, well, I'm going with you. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And so the basic theme that we have in this first chapter is Naomi is bitter. She feels that God has left her. But Ruth says, I'm not going to leave you. And that really is where the story begins. As we looked at chapter 2, we looked at chapter 2 as a case study in the, day of the life of Ruth. And one of the things that we found in chapter 2 was that Ruth, because of her goodness and her uh, a blessing to Naomi in going with her, that uh, Ruth was blessed. Uh, Boaz saw her and, and said to her, the Lord repay you for what you've done. Uh, and uh, then uh, Naomi, uh, after Ruth came back from gleaning in Boaz's field, was just amazed at what God had done. And uh, her attitude began to change. And as Naomi looked at the story there, she said, the Lord has not stopped showing kindness to us. And so in the first chapter, the Lord's hand was against her, but in this second chapter, she begins to see God showing kindness to her because of Ruth and because then of what has occurred because of Ruth. In chapter 3, you remember we had Ruth going to the threshing floor uh, in the middle of the night as Naomi had instructed her. And uh, there, instead of being molested as it might have happened, uh, Boaz responded to her with respect and, and recognized her noble character. And uh, then... Uh, he said to her, I would like to redeem you, but I can't. There is another kinsman who is nearer than I. So tonight we're looking at the case study of the other kinsman redeemer. And if you have your Bibles, uh, you might turn with me, and uh, we'll begin looking at this text, Ruth chapter 4. As we look at uh, the story, I will again put on the screen the parallel structures as we develop them in the text. Uh, so... Uh, as I read, I'll just uh, pick up the key parts of the story. It begins, verse 1, Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat there. 
When the kinsman redeemer he had mentioned came along, Boaz said, Come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, Sit here. And they did so. Then he said to the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our brother Elamelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem, redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. <clears throat> then Boaz said, On the day you buy the land from Naomi and from Ruth, the Moabitess, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. Mm. At this the kinsman redeemer said, Then I cannot redeem it, because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transaction in Israel. So the kinsman redeemer said to Boaz, Buy it yourself, and he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and to all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have brought from Naomi all the property of Elamelech, Kilian, and Malan. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabitess, Malan's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from the town records. Today you are witnesses. Then the elders and all those at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. We'll stop there. As you look at this story, uh, the structure of the text follows the same kind of parallel themes that we have seen in each of the other chapters in Ruth. And uh, in this particular case, the centerpiece of the story is about redemption. Uh, and the kinsman redeemer who has the rights says, I can't redeem it. You do it, Boaz. You're the one who is to make the change. Now, if you remember, the, the previous story ended uh, with Naomi's statement, Boaz will not rest until the matter is done. And so this story now is about his action and what happens. And as we look at it, we see the whole community in operation. This story is interesting to me because of the context in which it occurs. We don't have much data, but we have the data that's basically here in the text. So let's look at it and let's reflect on some of the questions. First question is, uh, what was the legal system that Boaz had to use to settle this case? I can't hear you. A leadership group with elders. <clears throat> OK, a leadership group with elders. Uh, what, uh, how does it work? Where do they meet? At the gate. I, I'm sorry? At the gate. OK, at the gate. Uh, and uh, how often do they meet? What do you, what do you see in the text? I mean, how did Boaz get this meeting? He just called it while they were passing by. He said, <laughs> okay, good, James. Uh, people are coming by. He grabs them. Hey, stop. Sit down. Yeah. <laughs> so as Boaz goes to the gate, he waits. And as people come by, he grabs them until he has how many? Ten, ten of them. Okay, he's got ten elders at the gate. Now, there are probably more than ten elders in Bethlehem. But uh, he needs ten. And so the first 10 that comes through, he grabs them, and uh, he has them sit down. So as you look at this, the first thing that you see is that the court system is really the public, okay? the elders in the community. And the place is the gate. That's where they meet. And so Boaz goes to that place, and he gets the people he needs, and then he calls court into session. Uh, when the kinsman redeemer came along, uh, he said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. Uh, in other words, he calls him 
the court case is about to begin. Now, at this particular situation, the kinsman redeemer doesn't even know that uh, there is a decision to be made. He's just walking by, perhaps part of, he's coming to the gate like men usually do at this time. On this particular day, there's going to be a major meeting. All right, if, if we look at this, um, why does Boaz ask for a decision? What's his, what's his reason? Why, why is he burdened about this? He James? Wants, he wants to settle the conflict already there is uh, in his mind uh, who really is going to inherit Ruth and all the property of Naom and her sons. That's and right. He made a promise to yes. Ruth uh, that he would take care of it. Uh, and Naomi said he's not going to rest until this is done. So. This is on Boaz's mind, and he knows that he can't do anything legally until this other man makes a decision. That's really the reason. Boaz's hands are tied, okay? He is unable to do what he wants to do, which is to marry Ruth, because of this other man. And so in this particular context, then, he has to force the decision so that, it, that he is then either has to forget the whole thing, or he's free to do what he wants to do. All right, in thinking about this, why is the marriage of Ruth tied to the land? Think back again on what we've said about land and kinship. James? Um, because in order to gain the land, it's basically uh, keeping the family. And in order to keep the family, they, they have to perpetuate the family line. That was part of it, I think, the deliberate tradition or something like that. Okay, you have tradition of inheritance. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what are the inheritance rules, Peter? Uh, the, the land was basically tied to the family, so in order for if uh, a person who owned the land, uh, if the male uh, died, then the family was perpetuated by the next in line, maybe perhaps a brother or next in kin. Okay, and what's the difference between the way we handle money, I mean, we handle land, and the way they handle land? If, for example, I died, can my wife sell my land? Here in America? Yes. 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 My house? Yes. yes. Sure. I mean, she has complete freedom. She is, you know, we hold it in joint tenancy. And so if I die, she has the freedom to do what she wants with it. She could sell it. She can burn it down. Uh, you know, whatever she wants to do, she can do. In other words, it's hers to dispose of. The difference here is that the land is not held by the individual. And this comes back to the issue that we were talking about earlier, individualism versus group. And so in this context, the group really has rights to the land. Uh, it's not something that the individual can dispose of as they want to. This is strategic. It's critical. Missionaries have had more misunderstandings with nationals around the world over this issue than probably any other one. A missionary group will come in and they'll buy a piece of land, and they think that they bought it. Well, what they bought was the use right, uh, but they thought they bought the title. And so 35 years later, when the kinsmen come back and say, we want the land back, the missionaries are all upset. We paid for that. We bought it. And there are very deep differences in assumptions about the land. The people who sold it were not selling the land, they were selling the use. Uh, and the money they got, they thought, well, that was fine for the period of time. But our custom is when we sell the land, it's final. And there is no recourse. You don't go back and get land again uh, 35 years later and say, well, I sold it to you. You've had 35 years use. Now I want it back. Well, that's just not the way we do it. With, with Naomi and Ruth, that's the way it's done. Uh, the kinsmen always retain the residual rights to the land. You cannot alienate it. And so in this context, you see, it's crucial to, to understand that if this kinsman is going to take his right, and he's the first one in line, he also has to take Ruth. Now, that's the other part of it. The land is to support the wife and the children. Okay. And so he can't just take the land because the wife is a living. And if he takes the land, he has an obligation to give the wife children. And so that becomes a key issue. So why did the kinsman redeemer say, I can't do it? 
James. Because if he only had like one male offspring, then all of his possessions would fall, even his possessions would probably be under that child, would be under, was it Mel Malian's line still? And if he doesn't have two sons, then then his then his line dies off pretty much, or his own personal. Okay, he's concerned about his own line. Now, we don't know how many children he had. We don't know if he had boys or girls. But one of the things he does say is that I have an estate of my own. And what's he concerned about? He doesn't want to forfeit it. He doesn't want to forfeit it. Okay, he doesn't want to. Now, James... Can you tell us what might be the problem from your cultural perspective? If he takes this woman for his wife, he bears children by her, what does that do for his other children? Uh, his other children, the land will be divided also among the children of Ruth's line. Okay. Because they become his too. Okay. And uh, he does not want that to happen. Okay. Um, and he is clever in that, in that way. Okay. If he had several children by Ruth, this then could put his other children dividing up his, the, all of his land and make it, disperse it much more broadly. Correct. And he really doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to risk the inheritance he already knows he has for his own children. Uh, I don't know how big Malian and Killian's land was. It may not have been that much worthwhile land. And maybe that's why they went to Moab in the first place. The land wasn't enough to feed them. And so the whole issue of how valuable their land was was a question that uh, we don't really know much about. What we do know is that when it was just the land, this man said, sure, I'll buy it. Uh, but when he found out that he had to take Ruth, wait a minute, I'm not interested in this anymore. Because not of Ruth, but because of his own estate and his own children. All right. Uh, how is this decision recorded for the public record? The giving of the sandal. Okay. Taking off the sandal. What do you think the significance of that is? The text tells us about it. Uh, if, if you think about it in a broader context, why would something like this be necessary? How do we... How do we uh, do the same thing in our own culture today. What's the equivalent of taking off our sandal today? Julie? Signing a contract. Signing a contract. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, we have paper and uh, we, we've signed the legal paperwork to get this done. It's recorded in the court records. So, for example, if you were to buy a piece of land, then your attorney would create a paper for you it would be signed and it would be taken to the court and registered in the court. Uh, so this court registration then makes it known to anyone who wants to look through the records, oh, that particular piece of land is owned by Sherwood Lingenfelter, who bought it in 1984 uh, and uh, has continued to live on it since that time. So the court record would be the, uh, the paperwork that would provide for us the record of their transaction. In this case, uh, how is the transaction actually recorded? It's witnessed by the ten elders. Exactly. Witnessed by the ten elders. Okay. Boaz announces what? Today you are witnesses. witnesses. Okay. And the ten elders at the gate say, we are witnesses. 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 That's exactly right. So you see there is this public ritual that they go through. The sandal comes off. The sandal is the symbol that I accept the decision. In other words, the other redeemer said, I'm taking off my sandal to show you that I'm yielding my rights to you. Uh, then Boaz announces to the elders, you are my witnesses. They say, we are your witnesses. Uh, and so the matter then is settled in this public way with the ten witnesses being the record uh, that is there for us to have from that time after that. They don't have paperwork. They don't have attorneys. They don't have a uh, system of court records. What they have are the witnesses who then pass that on generation after generation by word of mouth to affirm their legal system. So this case shows us then a community at work. We basically have a structure of making decisions. 
we have a process of establishing legality, and we have actually a legal decision transacted here. One man giving up his rights, another man taking them, and out of that, a public contract of marriage. All right, if we go on, uh, the chapter ends with the uh, uh, final 13 to 22 verses. The interesting thing is that these verses parallel the first verses in the story. And so, uh, for the sake of comparison, I'm just going to go back and show you the parallel. I'm going to read again the first part of the chapter and uh, run through that quickly, and then we'll read the end, and you'll see the juxtaposition of the themes. If you remember the story started, there was a famine in the land, and uh, Malan and his wife and two sons went to live in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elamelech, uh, and then his two sons were Malan and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. You have the famine in the genealogy. It starts out with that structure. It says now Naomi's husband Elamelech died. She was left with her two sons. Uh, and uh, they married Moabite women. And uh, Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. And then she heard that uh, the Lord had come to the aid of Judah. And uh, so uh, Naomi and her daughter-in-law prepared to return home to Israel. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she'd been living, set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. And as they were on the road, Naomi turned to her two daughters-in-laws and said, go back. Uh, she said, go to your own mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness of you shown to the dead in me. May the Lord grant each of you to find rest in the home of your husband. And so they, she kissed them and they wept aloud. And she said to her, we will go back to your people. Now Naomi said, uh, I'm too old to have another husband. Even if there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight, uh, would you wait until they grow up? No, my daughters, it's more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. And so we see the story of Naomi. Uh, she went to Moab full. She came back to, Jer to Israel bitter, uh, empty. All that she had desired is gone. Now if you turn to the end of the chapter, Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And then he went to her and the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The woman said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout all Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This, then, is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salomon. Salomon, the father of Boaz. Boaz, the father of Obed. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David. Now, as we've gone through this story, you see that all the things that God took away from her in the beginning, mm -hmm. he has given back to her in the end. She has a daughter-in-law who's better than seven sons. She has a child when her Sons had no children. Uh, there now she has a grandchild. Uh, she uh, is the, uh, the, the in, in essence, the woman who is at the beginning of a lineage that results in David, who is the king of Israel. And so uh, God has really blessed Naomi. Uh, to all the things that she thought were against her, the Lord has restored to her in a marvelous way at the end of this chapter. Now, as we think about that, we want to take a look at the social meaning of this, uh, this book, and particularly the social meaning as it reflects on Naomi's, com Naomi's complaint and God's response to her. How did God answer her complaint? In the first chapter, the Lord's hand is against me. Uh, I have no hope. How does he respond? What happened? In the end, he gives her a daughter-in-law daughter better than seven sons. Okay. A daughter-in-law better than seven sons. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really an incredible blessing when you think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and Naomi thought she had nothing. What else does he do? Mm -hmm. She 
has a grandson. She has a grandson. That's right. You know, and not only that, probably more children. This is just the beginning. Mm -hmm. But a grandson, one who carries on whose name? Elimelech's name. Elimelech's name. That's right. The name of her husband. Okay, and mm -hmm. who uh, is whose child legally? Naomi's. Naomi's child. That's right. Uh, <laughs> Belongs to Naomi. Naomi has a child. You know, she has a child again. What a wonderful thing you see here that God has given her a child, according to the text. That she is the one who has legal rights to this child. Okay. Uh, Naomi decided to tough it alone. Okay. She said, "I'm going to go back by myself. You girls can stay here, uh, and uh, you go back to your relatives." But God really wasn't content with that. How did God intervene? What did God do for Naomi? Again, thinking back to the beginning of the story. Peter? She, she gave, uh, well, Ruth was still a part of, part of her life. And in the end, uh, Boaz was given to him as a kinsman redeemer. OK, good. God gave her first Ruth. OK, and that's really important. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Ruth, what, what was Ruth's declaration to Naomi? You told me to go back, but she said, Your people shall be my people. Your people shall be my people? Your God shall be my God. Your God shall be my God. So Your this, shall be my land. that's right. Your country will be my country. The, so Ruth makes this tremendous commitment to her. Then God gives them Boaz uh, and gives them food from Boaz's field and then gives them bounty from Boaz's harvest and then gives them Boaz to be the father of her child uh, through Ruth for the next generation. So really God intervened in a miraculous way in this story. God intervened on behalf of Naomi to restore to her all that she had lost. Uh, in chapter 4 verse 16 you have uh, a reference to Naomi and her newborn child and as you think about that uh, how does that compare to God's work? In, in uh, this verse it says, Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, and cared for him. How does that compare with God's actual work for the people of this town of Bethlehem and for the people of Israel? Back in the very beginning of the story, the parallel text there focused on uh, the famine and what happened after the famine. James? Okay, the restoration. In fact, it's interesting that the, the English translation doesn't pick it up, but in the English translation it says that God came to the aid of Israel, okay, uh, and that when Naomi heard that, she went back. This particular verse says, Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and cared for him. And so Naomi, in, in essence, is the mirror opposite of God caring for the people. God did exactly that for them. God provided for them. God picked up Naomi took her in his lap, if you will, and provided for her. And now Naomi, on the other side of it, takes the child in her lap and cares for him. And that child becomes the grandfather uh, that um, will be the grandfather to David, who will be a man after God's own heart and will be the king that begins the line through which Christ will come for Israel. So that's a very important uh, in part of this story. Okay. Uh, if we look at the birth of Obed and what that meaning was for Naomi, what does the text tell us about that? The women living there said, who has a son? Naomi, Naomi has a son. <laughs> we wouldn't say that, would we? No. That's just not part of the way we think. You know, it's not part of our meanings. It's not part of our context and how we see the world. Naomi has a son. Uh, why is it Naomi's son? Because since Elimelech and both Malian and Killian died without an heir, in response to, in response to, in, like what that verse said, she has to have a son in order to, for him to continue on the line. So in effect, Obed becomes that son. Okay, you're exactly right. It's tied to the land. Yeah. In other words, and it's tied to the legal rights. And so the redeeming of the land is Elimelech's land, 
and Ruth is Elimelech's uh, son's wife. And so the whole thing is linked again to the legality of the land and the people from it. And so this uh, is really the fulfillment of all of the legal obligations that are part of their social context and social setting. Uh, you remember we talked uh, about marriage and the legal responsibilities of marriage and the legal rights that are conferred in marriage. The kind of things that we're reading here just are so alien to our own culture and way of thinking. You know, it doesn't matter what my parents do. It doesn't matter what my grandparents did. You know, when I get married, I'm set out on my own. And if someday I would inherit something from them, well, fine. And if I don't, that's no problem. Uh, and it's, it's part of the cultural way we think. But for these people, it's very important that someone carry on the name of the lineage, that the land and the, the marriage and the children are all linked together in terms of legal rights. And that's an important part of how they see themselves in their world. Okay, as we conclude this, what would you say were some of the spiritual and social lessons that we've gotten out of the book of Ruth? What are some of the things that you have picked up as you've been looking at this story? I think that God um, changed Naomi's bitterness to blessing. Okay. Isn't that great? God changed Naomi's bitterness to blessing. Uh, very special thing that God did in this story. And you can understand her bitterness. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about the pain that she went through, uh, to, to go through this traveling and living in a strange place and losing your husband and your two sons, I mean, it has to be really a traumatic experience for her. Uh, and God just took that and turned it into joy. So that's special. What else? James? Uh, <clears throat> We, um, we should uh, think about the idea of doing it our own way and uh, allow God to intervene in circumstances because when he intervenes, there is a blessing. Okay, explain that again a little bit louder. <clears throat> Instead of uh, doing things in our own way, okay. we should allow God to intervene. Because when he intervenes, he does it in his own way, and there is a blessing there. Okay, good. Absolutely right. Trying to do it our own way uh, does not accomplish what we want. But when we let God do his work, that's significant. Good. Other lessons in this? I think um, especially during a time and place where everybody was doing what they wanted to do and doing what was right in their own eyes, mm -hmm. um, you see this... Um, couple, Ruth and Boaz, who were so obedient uh, to uh, what God wanted, and as a result of their obedience, you see the blessings. Okay. Excellent. Mm -hmm. In a social context in which everybody did what was right in their own eyes, mm -hmm. this is the fantastic story of how God <coughs> just honored those who were obedient to him. That application you can take into any culture. Mm -hmm. You can take it anywhere. Because... So oftentimes people do what is right in their own eyes. Mm. Or they do what is right in terms of their own social group. They do what is right in terms of their customs and their standards. But Naomi and Ruth honored God. And Boaz honored God. And the, the wonderful thing of bringing that all together uh, is really significant. James. The social norm is that uh, males have a uh, position of authority because even when when, uh, when Naomi uh, connected the network, now it was a male that was going to do the job until she received the end result. Okay, all right. Social importance of men in the context. It was Boaz who had to take the initiative to get this done. And, you know, it was his godliness and his willingness to do this that brought joy to everyone, including him. I mean, it was ultimately a, a significant outcome for him. James? I think just to develop that issue a little bit more, also this maybe like a sarcasm or just a pointed reminder that Ruth was considered better than seven sons. So the importance of women um, brought to light. Good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Good. Marcy? I think out of tragedy, it's amazing how the lineage of David and ultimately the birth of Jesus came mm. out of the situation. Mm. And you can actually see God 
divinely inspiring the entire situation. Even in the midst of loss, there was great fruitfulness in the end that would yeah. come in the Old Testament. I mean, in the New Testament, yeah. rather. I think that's a wonderful conclusion for this session. Mm -hmm. uh, out of tragedy, God brings forth David and the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, what, what does that tell us about our own lives? In other words, that God brings forth fruit for his glory out of oftentimes our pain and our suffering. So uh, let's carry that with ourselves. Think about it in terms of how we live and also encourage others with this, that sometimes it's in their pain and suffering that God is bringing about that plan which will bring great glory to himself and joy and real delight to us. Let's close. Okay? Now you can ask your question, David. We're off camera. As we continue in this session this evening, uh, before I actually go into the lecture on social stratification, I want to review briefly the types of uh, political and social games that we have been talking about. On the screen, you see variation in community authority. And uh, as we look at that variation, we find that there are four distinctive social games that we've been discussing. Uh, <clears throat> in the first part of the lecture uh, in the last hour, I talked about the differences between uh, aggregation and centralization. Uh, well, as we look at the, the diagram that you have, uh, the authoritarian and the individualist games are games that are, tend to be aggregate. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry. The individualist games is an aggregate game. And the egalitarian game is aggregate in the sense of not having leadership. But the top of the screen, the authoritarian and the hierarchist have some kind of structure, the centralization. Okay. So the, the top of the screen is the centralized part. Either the authoritarian game or the hierarchist game have the structuring of authority. When we look at it from the perspective of the coordination, belonging in group, or the uh, individualism, the uh, independence that people have, then we move from the uh, left side of the screen to the right side. The left side, the authoritarian individualist games, are not strong in group. They're very much individualistic, uh, whereas on the right side, you have the hierarchist and the egalitarian games, where group is very important. Belonging is a key part of their culture. So we've defined this on the screen in terms of grid, up and down, group, uh, the horizontal dimension of that. And the strong group uh, games are the hierarchist and the egalitarian games. The strong grid games are the authoritarian and the hierarchist. Uh, so they actually f operate in a little bit of a different framework. Now, as we think about what this means in terms of social life, uh, the individualist game is one in which you have a great deal of freedom and a great deal of interpersonal um, uh, decision making in terms of community life and activity. Uh, leaders tend to be flamboyant. They tend to uh, exercise their own independent power. They really don't spend a lot of time uh, building community. Uh, they tend to be what I would call a man for the moment. If we look at the authoritarian game, you have hierarchy being much more important. You have the whole notion of independent power. The leaders on top are powerful. Uh, they make decisions uh, from the top, and uh, they tend to try to run the show. There are a lot of churches like this where the pastor is very, very central in terms of what uh, he or, or some cases she uh, decides should be done in that particular work. So the, the issue of the authoritarian uh, is one where you have a hierarchy and the accountability is framed within the hierarchy itself. As we look at the um, hierarchist game, the hierarchist game also has hierarchy, but the hierarchy is accountable to the group. And that's really key. The hierarchy can't act of itself. It has a group pressure, uh, a group command that ties it together and makes sure that there is some accountability. Uh, delegated power is key in the hierarchist uh, framework. You have corporate management. And so there are people who are on the top, but they delegate a lot of power down. And that power is also shared corporately with others in the group. And so it's in that process of corporateness and, and hierarchy working together 
that creates the distinctiveness of the hierarchist social game. Finally, we have the egalitarian game. And uh, the egalitarian game doesn't like leadership. Uh, if you really want to know how egalitarians work, they don't follow. Uh, they pull everybody together, and you act together in a cohesive group. You work together as a corporate body, uh, but you don't follow leaders. In, because of this, then, they have to have ideals. They have to have an ideology that they follow, that they work on. And this ideology is something they tend to be unified in their agreement on it. They're very committed to believing the same kind of things. And if there's disputing among them, the group <coughs> often fractures and divides. Uh, one of the reasons why egalitarian groups never get very large is because everybody has to agree with everybody else. And that's very difficult for human beings to do. And so when it gets to two or 300 people, they tend to have disagreements, and the group fractures. Uh, we find this then that egalitarian societies tend to have what we call segmentary type groups. They keep splitting. Uh, and they usually don't get much larger than two to 300 people in any group. Uh, authoritarian and hierarchist uh, organizations are able to manage much larger uh, numbers of people because they have this structure that binds people together. Uh, the authoritarian, of course, through the sheer power of the authority structure, whereas the hierarchist depends both on the allegiance to the group as well as the hierarchy. Individualism is a kind of a social game in which people uh, don't really value a group, and so they don't care. Networks are really the key components of that. Now, as we go on in the, the series of lectures that follow tonight, we're going to be looking at issues of networking. And networking occurs in all four of the games. Uh, but it's just pervasive in the individualist game because that's primarily how people connect to each other, networks or what we call activity groups. In the other three games, you have e existing structures through which people can connect, whether they're the authority structure in the top two games or the group structure in the egalitarian game, which binds people together and makes it a powerful part of what happens. You notice in the middle of the diagram, I have the pilgrim. And when I talk about pilgrimage, what I'm talking about is in our Christian lives, we can play any one of the games. There is not one game that is a God-given game. It's very important to understand this right from the beginning. In fact, you and I probably play at least two of these games and maybe more. I mean, you can play all four of them, not at the same time. It's like if you're going to play checkers, you play that this hour, and then when you're finished, you then move on to Monopoly uh, or some other game. You can't play them all at once, but in, as you move through time and space, you can participate in, in any one or all of these social games. The key thing about pilgrimage is that as pilgrims in Christ, we are able to play any of the games, but we play them differently. We play them because we are motivated by Jesus Christ. We're committed to him. And through him, we live lives that are unique and different in our world. And so I have here the notion of metaphors of ministry are what drive us in whatever game that we play. And it's interesting. The metaphor that Jesus chooses to use most often in the New Testament is servant. He says, in the world in which you live, there are overseers, or those who lord it over you. But he said, among you it will not be so. Uh, and he says, who is the greatest among you, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? Well, of course, it's the one who sits at the table, but I am among you as one who serves. And that's really the key. In other words, he is among us in the servant's role, and he says, that's the role that we're to have. And so as we think about our position in culture and what God calls us to, it's really the servant. It's the brother. It's the sister. It is the fellow worker. It is the, the, the metaphors that you find in the scriptures for us are all metaphors having to do with family and community and serving uh, and following, uh, not metaphors of power. So, in fact, one of uh, a, f a friend of mine, David Bennett, says that you don't find the word leader in the New Testament. Instead, you find follower. Jesus says, follow me. And that's really the key that we need to work on as we think about this. So as you look at these games and you think about how all of this applies to our notion of Christianity, metaphors for ministry, we want to keep working on the idea of pilgrimage. And I bring that up to the focus as we look at this uh, and try to keep that as kind of a background in our thinking as we look at all of these social characteristics. 
All right, now the subject for our concluding lecture this evening is race, class, and ethnicity, and the issues of power and control. From the comments I've made so far, you can see that Jesus really is concerned about us not being preoccupied with power and control, but rather being preoccupied with service and giving. Uh, and yet what we find in society is we have pervasive patterns of race, class, and ethnicity that are power and control issues. So as we look at this subject tonight, I'm going to begin with the subject of social differentiation. No matter where you go in the world, people tend to make differences in reference to other people. And the social kind of differences tend to follow in certain kinds of patterns. The paradigm of social differentiation that we're going to look at tonight comes from an anthropologist by the name of Gerald Berriman. He is not a Christian. He has absolutely rejects Christianity. Uh, but uh, his observations, I think, are pretty accurate. Because what they do is they help us to see the nature of sin in the world and the barriers that have been constructed in human cultural life because of the <coughs> sin in our nature and our relationships. Behrman talks about class, uh, status, and power. And the components of class, status, and power are wealth, prestige, and control over others. Usually, class differences are based upon wealth dimensions of culture. And so as you think about what's happening in terms of a society and social relationships, when you have a class system, it usually always is connected to a wealth system, a differential distribution of wealth. Uh, one of the things that I've observed in America is that the more prosperous people get, the more they want to change the place they live. So, for example, what you find is that you keep buying a different and a bigger house in a different neighborhood. And typically, what people do is they buy the best house that they can afford in the best neighborhood they can afford. And they, then as they increase their social, uh, they, they increase their personal wealth, they buy another house in another neighborhood. They sell the old one and they move. And so they keep working to get themselves into the highest social class neighborhood in which they can afford to live. Uh, if they have an unfortunate problem with reference to the, uh, the kind of, uh, well, if they can't pay their mortgage, let's be blunt about it. <laughs> if they overextend themselves and can't pay their mortgage and they lose their property, then they have to step down into a lower social class neighborhood, start over again, and then try to be able to sustain an economic life that will work in that context. As you think then about this issue of social class, it's always connected to wealth. And this is anywhere in the world. You have class systems emerge because of wealth differences in social setting. Status differences are also an important part of culture. Status is different from class in the sense that status can be a position that person has within a social class can be a position the person has within a social group. So for example, James has told us in, in reference to his family that Mbuva is the head. Uh, and uh, his father is clearly the one who has the highest status in, in the group. The woman who has the first son is of higher status than the woman who didn't have a son. And so status becomes a prestige position in relationship to others within a family setting. Uh, you can have status within a church community. You can have status within an academic community. For example, at Biola, we have professors. And we have associate professors and assistant professors and instructors. It's a status position. And it's based upon prestige and ranking in reference to the kind of, of social structure that we have. Finally, the issue of power is the issue of how you, what kind of control you have over others in the social setting in which you work. If we follow uh, Richard Adams that we've talked about earlier, Adams talks about control being primarily over resources and not over others. Behrman talks about control over others. Well, in actuality, we, we don't have control over other people. We control things that they want. And if we have control over something they want, then they submit to us because we have something they want. So in truth, power is really a relationship in which someone else has something we want and we submit to them in that context because of that relationship. All right. These then are just 
uh, underlying principles upon which we work. Uh, and we'll see that in any social setting, you can have class differences, you can have status differences, and you can have power differences. And so as you look at what, what drives a social family, uh, community, uh, a network, you may find that it has within it these components that we're looking at. Uh, to try to understand what effect this has on people, uh, we'll take a look further at how we've studied this in social science. We talk about race, caste, ethnicity, and sex as being additional forms of social distinction. Uh, they, um, the, the first three things that we've talked about, you can find in any racial group, in any caste system, in any ethnic group, and in any uh, males and females. In other words, you can have class uh, status and power. So those are the broad categories. These are more specific. And these particular social distinctions are distinctions that, first of all, are a consequence of a person's birth and identity at birth. Generally in society, uh, you, you don't have a choice whether you're born male and female, although there are some people who go through operations today to try to change that. Uh, so by our birth, we have male-female distinctions. We've already seen that across cultures, that plays importantly in terms of what happens and how people think about other one another. There are sex-defined roles. There are sex-defined patterns of labor. There are sex-defined patterns of authority. And we've already looked at that in, in our previous lectures as we've discussed these things. Now, as we think about this from a biblical perspective and point of view, one of the things that we can see is that these sex distinctions and the injustice that come from them are a consequence of sin. We can also see that in Christ, Paul says there is no distinction. There is no difference between male and female, that we are all one in Christ. Now, he also talks about headship, and it's interesting. Um, we had my pastor preach on this last Sunday, and so I just can't help but say something about this tonight. Uh, there is a difference between authority and power, and there's a difference between headship and dominance. Okay? Now, we, we read a passage in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that talks about the fact that uh, the man is the head of the woman, uh, Christ is the head of man, and God is the head of Christ. Uh, and in thinking about that particular passage of Scripture, there's been all kinds of debate on this. But what I want to say about this is that if you understand that in terms of delegated authority, then Christ is under God. God has delegated authority to Jesus uh, to act uh, in following the Father and doing the Father's will. Then it says, Christ has delegated authority to the husband to act and follow uh, in the path that Christ sets before him. And then Christ has delegated authority from the husband to the wife so that the wife will follow uh, in the path of the husband as the husband follows in the path of Christ and as Christ follows in the path of God. So what you have is what I call delegated authority. Now it's very important to understand that any authority that's delegated can be taken back. The president has delegated to me the authority as provost of Biola University but I don't have a contract. And any day, he can say to me, Sherwood, you're fired. <laughs> and you no longer can serve in this role. And take the, in other words, I, there is nothing except his word that keeps me in that position. It's delegated authority, and it can be removed, removed at any time. That's exactly the relationship we have in Christ. It's the relationship that Christ has with the father and the husband has to the wife. Now, the key thing I want to say here is this. If I, as a husband, do not follow Christ, I've lost the delegated authority to lead my wife. Uh, if this authority comes from God, and Christ is subordinate to God, and I am subordinate to Christ, and my wife is subordinate to me, it's all in this business we're following, the leader. Okay. And if I fail to follow Christ, then I have lost the legitimate right to lead my wife. Okay. Now, what then do I do? I dominate her. That's sin. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> domination is sin. Uh, domination is Satan's path. Uh, Satan takes power and he uses it over people. And he exercises power to control it. 
I'm not allowed to dominate. In fact, the scriptures tell me very clearly that I am to love my wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So what I want to distinguish here is the difference between class, status, and power and authority that we have in Christ. And I want to say to you that, we, that the scriptures are talking about Christ's submission to God, the husband's submission to Christ, and the wife's submission to the husband which is a whole different kind of relationship than a power relationship. It's one based upon the obedience of all of those participants to God and to God's purpose and plan for us. And as soon as we get outside of that relationship and we move into human patterns of power and dominance, we've lost the whole picture. Uh, and so oftentimes Christians confuse dominance with authority. Uh, we have authority under Christ, uh, but if we're not under him and following him, we've lost it. We're no longer legitimate. Uh, and so in, in looking at this kind of relationship, I think it's very important to see that Christ is not making the distinctions that we make in our cultures between male and female. Uh, he is really calling us into a different kind of relationship, and that's why headship is not dominance. Uh, it is following. Uh, God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of the man. The man is the head of the woman. All of us following the ones who are over us, God being the one who is over us all. Now, the Greek, may I make a, a yes. addition? The Greek word is, uh, is kephale, mm -hmm. and uh, it suggests that the husband is to be the spiritual leader. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the spiritual leader is focused on his obedience to Christ, yes. you see. And that's really the whole point that I'm trying to make here. So, in, in looking then at these distinctions, that really should also be pervasive in all the rest of this that we think about. Because if it's true about sex, it's also true about ethnicity. It's also true about caste. It's also true about race. Uh, that God calls us to differences. And if you remember, in the book of Colossians, Paul says there is no, uh, I'm blanking on it now. Uh, I guess I could pick up my Bible and read no it, couldn't Jew, I? No uh, there's, there's no Jew and no Greek, no bond, no slave, no Scythian, uh, or uh, yeah, wh whatever they are, okay? Uh, in Colossians uh, 3 and in Galatians, he uses the same set of phrases. That these distinctions that we make among ourselves have no place in the body of Christ. Right. Now they have a major place in our world. And that's what I want to talk about. Let's look at the social consequences of these things, recognizing that we as Christians are called to be different. Uh, I've, I've picked this up uh, in uh, Colossians. He says, in, do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here, in the image of the Creator, there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Uh, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. You notice that paradigm is really important, and I bring that up front. Because what we're going to say about these other things is that there is not forgiveness in them. Uh, there, is, uh, there are all kinds of emotions and values that come in them that become a part of the social fabric that is part of our culture. Okay, we've talked about identity. It's part of birth. We've talked about worth. Each one of these categories defines in it innately some sense of social worth. So, for example, in America, the black-white distinction has really been one that Black people were not worth what white people were worth. The black people were brought to America as slaves. And this tragic distinction in our history then became one that's carried over even into our modern day culture and our world. There are many people that suffer from this even today. And they suffer from it here at Biola University in ways that are tragic and which shouldn't be a part of a Christian community. But what happens is that as we carry with us the baggage of our sin and our social worlds, that baggage becomes part of our resistance to transformation. The same thing is true with ethnicity. Uh, it, I remember when I was growing up, uh, my, um, 
the, uh, well, I'll confess, okay? My family had this pattern in it that was really what I consider to be a despicable pattern. But I heard this from my aunts and from some of my uncles. Uh, when I did something that was good, they'd say, that's Lingenfelter blood. Uh, when I did something that was bad, they said, that's your mother in you. Uh, and, uh, you know, the terrible criticism of my mother, absolutely false. You know, it wasn't my mother's fault at all. It was mine. <laughs> you know, but what, what they would do is they would say, okay, if you did something good, that's the Lingenfelter blood. If you did something bad, that's the Rogers blood. Well, of course, nothing could be further from the truth. What were they doing? They were building up themselves by putting down somebody else. Now, even my father's sisters did this, okay? It wasn't just my father's brothers that did it. The other thing they would do is they would say, well, you know, uh, those guys over there, uh, they're fish eaters. You know, you can't trust them. Well, what did that mean? Well, it meant they were Roman Catholic, okay? And uh, they weren't Protestant like us, and so we couldn't trust them because they were fish eaters. Again, building ourselves up by putting others down. Uh, they would talk about... The Dagos and the Wops, okay? Well, the Dagos were the Italians, and the Wops were Hungarians, and they weren't ethnic Germans like we were, okay? And so we were putting down others by building ourselves up by putting down others. Now, that pattern is tragic because it happens all over the world. It happens in every cultural context. Uh, in the island of Yap, where I worked in Micronesia, I showed you some of those slides. The Yapis consider themselves the top, the superior. And the Palauans, they were nobody. The Ulithians, they were really low. Uh, now, these are people that you and I would look at and say they're all the same, okay? But not to the Yappies. Not only the, that, the Yappies had in their own society a distinctive social caste. They had a low caste and a high caste. The low caste were people who were born in certain inland villages whose ancestors many, many generations ago had been disinherited from the lands of their families because there was no more land. And so they became tenants on somebody else's land, and their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren have been tenants ever since, and they're serfs, and they're called pamilii in the Yappies culture, and that word means run to do it. Uh, and the other people are pilung, those who are give the word. Okay, so here you have those who have land and those who don't, those who don't serve as tenants, and when those who have the land tell them, they run to do whatever they're asked to do. So here it is in the people of the same racial type, uh, a subtype called Micronesians, you have this distinction of caste, high caste and low caste. This sin is a pervasive sin that has scattered all over the, I mean, it's, it's pervasive in human society and culture. And as we look at human society and culture, we see that these distinctions are distinctions that define people's worth. If you are pamilling eye on Yap, you are of no value. Uh, I remember one of my language helpers going with me into a village, and we sat down uh, with a man, and he was reading Tolstoy. Uh, and uh, we began to speak to him, and he spoke beautiful English. And I said, what are you reading Tolstoy for? I've never read them. Oh, he said, I really enjoy these novels. They're incredible. And I was just so impressed with his English. And after a while, uh, he said, uh, here, I've got some food. Let's eat together. And uh, we ate together. And then uh, as we walked out of the village, my language helper said, I would never eat in this village. Uh, but uh, because you were with me, it was OK. And I eat here. This is a low caste village. Uh, and uh, I could never eat here. Don't tell my family that I ate here. <laughs> now, it, it's interesting that the man in that village uh, was intellectually superior to the man who was my language helper. Uh, there was just no question of, I mean, there were two fine men, but this man in the village was just an A student, a college graduate, exceptional. The man who was with me hadn't graduated from college. He had a difficult time getting through. He made it. You know, he ultimately finished. But the man who was my language helper was from one of the highest ranking villages in Yat. Uh, and the man who was reading Tolstoy couldn't get a job. He was completely closed out of any government position. He finally left Yap and went to Guam to work on Guam, where they didn't know his caste and would allow him to participate and work with his skills. So as we look at these distinctions, you see they are 
issues that are, are very difficult for people that are in them. Uh, and basically, this worth that they have is kind of an inherent worth relative to all others in society, and it's a lifetime sentence, if you will. It's something that this, this man who is from this village in Yap called Banal is forever in that village. He can't get out of it. There's no way that he can change his identity, and there's no way that he can be received in the other setting uh, uh, appropriately. Likewise, a woman, my mother, lifetime sentence, you know. As my relatives evaluate my performance, my mother is always the cause of my badness and my father is always the cause of my goodness. I mean, it's absurd, but that's how it, it was structured in their thinking, in their way of doing things. These are false assumptions, and they are false premises upon which people build their cultural and their social life. Uh, but they become pervasive and they become devastating in terms of how societies work. Now, your job in terms of doing your research, is to find out how often race, caste, ethnicity, <coughs> sex, and the social distinction of class, status, and power are an important part of the social world in which you're working. Uh, as Christians, we have a responsibility to be like Christ in that context. These things are probably going to be there in some form or other. They're going to affect how people see their lives. They will affect you and me. One of the things that I can tell you is that I have been given social standing in places in the world where I've gone that I am completely undeserving of because of status issues, because of racial issues. For example, uh, when I was in Cameroon in 1978, uh, I met some wonderful people, just marvelous people in the interior of Cameroon. Uh, and there was, however, one thing that greatly troubled me. Some of the oldest men in the community called me Masa. Okay. I hated that. You know, why are you calling me Masa? You know, well, because all white men are Masas. You know, and these old men were there during the colonial period when the white men were their masters, and that's what they were told to call them. Uh, and that's what he called me. Uh, I didn't feel good about it. Uh, there were lots of young men that didn't call me that, but they called me professor. Okay. And uh, that's another one. That's another one, you know. Professor, because, professor, can you help me get a scholarship in the State University of New York, you know. And uh, they're looking for help. And I have status, you see. Not deserving it, nothing special. Uh, yes, I was a professor in the State University of New York, far less powerful than they thought. <laughs> you know, pretty insignificant, actually, in the whole pattern of things. But from their point of view, you see, I had access to things that they just thought maybe I could help them to get access to it. And they gave me status and power because of it. Now, the policemen, they weren't at all intimidated by me. They'd come up, have you checked into our station? I'm frightened and scared. And uh, yes, yes, I checked in. Are you sure? Let me see your paperwork. I have to haul out my paperwork and show them. You know, they weren't intimidated. They had power, and they had status, and I didn't. Uh, and so they exercised their power on me everywhere I went. The policemen always stopped me. They interrogated me. They made me show my papers, even if I had them. Sometimes they'd haul me down to the police station just to let their supervisor interrogate me so that uh, they, their power was known. So it's fascinating because here's all this playing of power. Okay. The old men giving me power that I don't really deserve and don't have authority and status. The young men giving me power that I don't have. The policemen saying, you're nothing. Uh, and we've got power over you. And if you don't have the papers, you get this. It's all part of the games that we play. And tragically, we use these power relationships against one another. That's why Jesus said, this is not the way I want you to live. This is not what I'm calling you to. I'm calling you to servants. I'm calling you to be like Christ. Okay, as we go into this and begin to look at how we study it, uh, there are some questions that we need to ask in our research. Uh, James, uh, why don't you uh, come up and join us for a second here? Uh, we'll put this microphone back on you. Uh, in thinking about uh, the kind of questions we would ask, one of the first questions are just what are the social positions? What are the kind of race, ethnic, and class uh, positions that you experienced in Kenya growing up? Great. Um, <clears throat> with the coming of Europeans, they were, of course, the British government particularly, and anybody that was uh, related to the British, 
anybody that was white was a European. Okay. That's how we understood it, and uh, we give him the name Mzungu. Okay. And um, was that a respectful name or was that a derogatory name? Mzungu is ro white. Okay. Okay. Just descriptive. Uh, yes, descriptive. White. And also, if we are talking along, we say Mzungu is coming. So he will not know whether we are talking about him. Okay. Um, so they were the rulers, they were the governors, and they controlled resources of okay. Kenya. And uh, even today, the, those old men that uh, saw the Mzungu mm -hmm. in operation, mm -hmm. uh, they tell us he is still Bwana. Okay. He is still Lord. Bwana in Swahili means Lord. Still okay. Lord. They would even go ahead and say Bwana Kubwa. Okay. The big lord. Okay. And uh, the Indians uh, who came there because of... These would be from South India, right? Yes, from South uh, India, affiliated with the British rule in India also. Okay. They came and they had like a second class okay. uh, uh, compared to the Africans. Okay. So they were the merchants, the businessmen, and also um, industries. They, they, they controlled industries like timber, like uh, metal and okay. things like that to this day. Okay. And then when we go to the tribes, uh, we have uh, at least uh, uh, 40, 43 tribes. Mm -hmm. They keep on multiplying because some of the tribes meet together and form another one. Um, the Kikuyu, which is the majority of uh, Kenyan uh, 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 tribal people, uh, they think they are the, 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 the best. They had the first president of, the, of Kenya, President Kenyatta. So they were there, the big people. And there are many. So they control resources, riches. They are rich. They also control uh, politics. Okay. And uh, that's why it was difficult for Moi as a minority, uh, uh, coming from a minority tribe, to become a leader. Okay, let me interrupt you for a minute. Let's uh, talk just a little bit about mm. the privileges that they yes. had and the rights. Uh, mm -hmm. In other words, uh, when you have this, these positions, whether it's the Buanas, uh, you know, yes. or uh, the Indians, or what, what are the kind of privileges and rights that they enjoyed and demanded? In they, that uh, particularly resources. Okay. The, uh, the, uh, the nationals had to bow down to receive uh, resources from them and power. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you want to go to school, if you want to go to, uh, to see somebody in the government, these were the people in power. And particularly now, uh, uh, the Kikuyu, when they were in power, mm -hmm. they were like the way to everything. Okay. They were like the way to the government, way to the resources of job, market, okay. they controlled that. And, uh, so that actually, if you wanted a job, you would probably have to go through a Kikuyu to get I it. Would, I would like to go through a Kikuyu because even during that time, there was a statement here, uh, Huyu ni Mwikamba, this is a Kamba. Okay. And, uh, and that's a derogatory term. Yeah, which means put him aside. Okay. The, uh, the Lua people were considered the intellect. They controlled the, uh, the officers. They controlled the higher places okay. of intelligence. Okay. And the Kamba were considered as military, okay. my tribe, okay. military expertise. They, okay. they, they fought in the Second World War. Okay. And, uh, they, they, they defeated the whoever. And uh, in the government, there are many in the, in, the, in the military. They are loyal to the government and uh, to, to their land. And um, at workplace, when you consider the, uh, those that work in the city of Nairobi, mm -hmm. of a higher rank, Mm -hmm. And those that work in the minor Do cities. they live in different places? Do they have uh, middle class neighborhoods, upper oh, class yes. neighborhoods? Oh, yes. In Nairobi, yes. Middle class, uh, 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 I mean higher class. In fact, there is a name now uh, by the name Mdosi. Okay. Mdosi are the high, high ranked people who live in uh, uh, high ranked houses, um, not in lower, lower places of living. And uh, government workers, of course, they, they, they think they are part of the system. Okay. So they are over higher. And bank workers, they, they, they control the money. Okay. And we go to them. And teachers have a place of, uh, of esteem mm -hmm. because of who, who they are. And I remember in the educational system, if you went to government-aided school, you are of a higher ranking than anybody that mm -hmm. went to, um, to a Harambe or okay. self-help 
uh, Harambe formed by the community. Let me ask you, have you experienced discrimination from any of these groups? In other words, been denied opportunities, been uh, publicly humiliated, or in any ways uh, experienced uh, what you would consider uh, high people looking yeah. down on you? Yeah, particularly uh, uh, in the field of academics. Okay. Uh, we did not go, my, myself and some other people, we did not go to a very high ranking school okay. in, uh, in Kenya. And uh, we had some other people that went to government aided school. Uh, mm -hmm. In this case, I can call it the Machakos Boys High School. Okay. And uh, government aided with the best teachers in the country. Mm -hmm. And what they did was, they did what they called physical science while we did general science. Mm. And we would meet in the arena where we wait for uh, public means, taxi, buses. And so one day a, a man looked at me from Machakos Boys High School and said, get out of here. You deal with general science, we deal with physical science, the pure thing. That ate my brain. <laughs> and um, what that did to me, I shared with my, my colleagues, mm -hmm. I told them, you know, uh, some, some people from this other school are sarcastic about us. Uh, what can we do? What we did, we studied night, day, every time. And when we, uh, when we did what we called the ESCE, East African Certificate of Education, we beat their school. <laughs> and we were number 10 while they were number 45. Okay. Well, that's fantastic. That's a good story. <laughs> uh, what about other kinds of discrimination? Have you experienced, uh, you know, from Indians, for example, in the shops or anything like that? Uh, is there any sense of ethnic uh, conflict or tension between the groups? Uh, yes. Um, uh, Indians can, um, can take advantage of us because we do not have uh, power over resources. And but do they? Yes, they have power over resources, okay. and they maneuver so much around the government. They know so well how to bribe. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, very good, okay. very good at bribery. You cannot take a, an Indian to court. He knows how to do it overnight, and tomorrow he's out of jail. Mm -hmm. And that frustrates the national people. Okay. In fact, one time the attorney general and the vice president complained about that, mm -hmm. and uh, nothing was done. Okay. So even up to this moment, the Indians who control the resources uh, uh, have a conflict with the nationals mm -hmm. who do not have the resources. Because it is like uh, when America speaks about the immigrants, I mean, uh, the nationals are saying, Indians are immigrants here, and they have everything, and okay. we are suffering. Mama. Okay, how do missionaries play involved? This is particularly Europeans. Uh, and have you, if, do you feel that these kind of social distinctions still exist among missionaries and nationals? Oh, purely. Okay. Um, uh, since a missionary is a white, that puts him in a very bad category. Mm -hmm. Because as the, as the other white uh, uh, men and women were taken by the common people, so they are. If he is going to live Christ-like life, he is going to be exceptional. But majority of them have the tendency of a colonial master. Okay. okay. Particularly when it comes on the side of uh, resources. And how do you see that expressed in your ministry? How have European missionaries like me been colonial masters? I, I, um, it is very easy for, for a national who has been trained by the, by the, by the Europeans to uh, 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 take such an authoritative position and, uh, and impose it on the people. Okay. So we are very careful. And uh, even right now, the reason why we suffer in Africa is because somehow we have been mixed up uh, uh, in our thinking uh, uh, because we have Western influence, mm -hmm. particularly from Britain. Mm -hmm. And we come into power and we begin to do things in a wrong way. Mm. In fact, we have a saying that if the, if the white man were ruling, for example, Kenya, mm -hmm. uh, we would be in a better position than, mm. than the nationals that have become leaders and they have now taken all the resources and banked it in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The white okay. man did not do so, okay. but they, they gave some uh, tribute to the, uh, to the queen. 
okay. and the key. All right. Do you have any questions you'd like to ask James? How has your experience been in the States? Um, <clears throat> question is, how has your experience been in the States? In case they didn't get Very bad. Very bitter. Because I came from a situation where I was, the Lord had walked my way up to a situation whereby I was accepted by my people. Mm -hmm. And when I came here, Nobody knew me, nobody accepted me, and I was just a little person passing by. Even when I greeted people, they did not greet me. And I looked at it and I said, what kind of uh, 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 belittling, I mean, I, I'm lacking words here, what kind of uh, life is this? Uh, very strong. And, uh, but uh, I walked out of it and said, I better come out of this, other, uh, otherwise I die, because uh, relationships are too difficult to develop, particularly I wanted to develop relationships with my um, African Americans, the, my fellow blacks, and uh, the, the, particularly the male has been very elusive, he runs away, I mean, he doesn't want to relate, and uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, I have been frustrated because these are the men I would like to, to reach and uh, be with, even in the church. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, here you are speaking about something which, uh, in fact, the white may favor me while my, my fellow African, uh, um, uh, African American, uh, shies from me. For reasons, if I have time uh, to do a second uh, dissertation, I may, I, I may do. <laughs> but uh, I don't know who will be the, uh, the chairperson. Uh, so um, I, have, I have been frustrated, but I have come out of it because number one, this course has helped me so much to understand people, including my own people. In fact, I saw my own people better when I first took this course. And I began to understand, my eyes began to see people and, and understand the dynamics of their social games. It's a game, there are some games, there are rules that I didn't know of American culture. And I think that's why I suffered, that's why it took me 89, 1991, bitter, and not doing anything for the Lord until the Lord came and said, you tell me you want to go and serve me in Africa. I want you to serve me here too. What? These people are weird. I, I, I don't understand. <laughs> but then uh, it was a commission. So I began to get into the ministry and interact with the people. I began teaching Sunday school in Glendale Presbyterian and things like that. When I came back to Biola, I affiliated myself with a missionary church uh, whose pastor was a, a um, Hebrew, I mean Jew, with another set of uh, hmm. class here. You know, so mm -hmm. I, have, uh, I have survived, and I thank God mm -hmm. <laughs> that uh, I have. Uh, but this cause is the root uh, cause of my understanding American culture, and being able to smile, mm. even in a culture like this. Mm -hmm. Well, praise the Lord. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> the work of God's grace, right? Yes, yes, by grace. And then, particularly the prison, everybody comes from a special prison. Thank you, James. Let me just uh, move quickly on through some of the things that we have here. Um, some of the questions that you have in your syllabus are really helpful in terms of exploring these things. Um, we can talk about the duties and obligations that others have in these kind of relationships. James is really focused so much on the resource issues. And there's so much about that because it's often of control. Uh, I was in Kenya this past summer and we were up at the Southern Baptist uh, Conference Center in Brackenhurst, which is up in the tea plantation area. And uh, one of the things that we did is we went to visit Mrs. Mitchell and her tea plantation. Well, Mrs. Mitchell has sold her tea plantation to a Kikuyu. Okay. Uh, and the Kikuyu has a bigger house than Mrs. Mitchell. And uh, the African workers who work for Mrs. Mitchell say that their Kikuyu uh, ma master in the tea plantation is much harder to work for than Mrs. Mitchell was. And so some of the patterns have been carried over and transferred, the bad ones, the negative ones, because sin just spreads like cancer. In other words, it just goes through our world. And, you know, it's interesting. 
in the past, of course, there's always sin in every culture and society. I mean, if you go back and look at the Yappies people, they developed their own system of stratification. They abused people in the bottom. And it's happened all over the world. It's not something that is peculiar to a race or to a people. But it's a pervasive pattern of racism, of yes. ethnic uh, hostility. And, and if we learn these issues and understand them, then we can begin to look at what, how we can be different in Christ. I want to come now to just some of the issues of the symbolic interactions that go on between people because I think this will help us to understand how this plays out in emotional relationships between people. As we think about uh, hierarchy as symbolic interaction, we look then at the kind of interpersonal relationships, the kind of interpersonal exchanges that occur. And usually what happens is that these express the ranking that people feel that they either claim or they perceive or they accord. For example, uh, James did the salute for us, OK? Yeah. Somewhere along the line, that became a response of those who are o under to those who are over. Yeah. Uh, it's part of the military, but it's, uh, it's spread further. And it's part of the, the rank expressed by both people, by the person who's subordinate as well as to the person who's over. There are also attitudes that go with this, attitudes uh, that express the feelings that people have. For example, down uh, is one of domination, deprivation, and oppression. You look at people, you're over them. You dominate them. You, uh, they don't need what you need. You take what you want. And so you can deprive from them. You can oppress them in your relationship. Upward, in contrast, is one where you show obedience and acquiescence and service and deference. Uh, and so, for example, uh, the masa that I got in Cameroon mm. was an upward acquiescence uh, by the elderly man. I mean, he was my senior. I should have been acquiescent to him, and especially in the Lord. But he insisted upon acquiescing to me. And those kind of, of, of expressions, you become hab habitual as part of who, how you see yourself. If you look at your emotions, the emotions are similar. You have emotional responses. If you're on top and looking down, you have fear of those that are below you. You're afraid that they're going to get angry. You're afraid you're going to rebel. You have guilt about what you're doing. You can be arrogant in terms of your understanding of who you are in relationship to others. You become self-righteous. All of these are emotions from the top looking down where you um, see the people that are supposedly subordinate to you in ways that are sin responses. Anytime we're afraid, we're only to fear God. Okay? And so when we fear others, that means that there's something wrong in our relationship. If we're arrogant or we feel guilty about it, that again becomes part of, of a position that we take that's really apart from Christ. The upward ones are the other side, envy, resentment, uh, resistance, dissimulation. They're, they're kinds of responses which, uh, which show, again, this up-down kind of relationship and, and fear and, and the conflict that grows between us. So as we look at these things, we see that out of the kind of ideology that we have and the symbolic interaction, you have all kinds of emotional responses that are destructive to people and are part of the sin responses of our life. Now, these relationships ultimately are inherently unequal. Uh, and uh, in, in, if they're played out in groups, the groups are unequal. For example, James talked about the Kikuyu and the Kamba. Mm -hmm. The Kamba are a lower group. Within the group, you have potentially equal relationships. But between them, they're superior and inferior. Uh, and that, again, is a part of how they play. All of these kind of systems have some kind of rationalization. People excuse it for have some way of culturally rationalizing, saying this is proper. The British rationalized their occupation of, of Kenya, uh, saying that Britain was divinely ordained by God to rule the world, uh, and that we came here to build up a better society and transform this culture. You have all of the kind of ideology of rationalization that's part of dominance. And it also can be part of subordination as well. And then the sexual stratification has basically the same kind of variables. Same stereotypes, same prejudices, same differential kinds of roles that you have when you have the prejudices that are racial and ethnic and so on. So as we look at these issues, we see that Christianity is different. 
as Christians, we should be living a different kind of a life. And that even though these things exist in our worlds, we should be agents of transformation working in contradiction to them. Working so that we can help people understand that in Christ there is no Jew or Greek. There is no circumcision or uncircumcision. There is no bond or free. That we are all one in Christ. And that's really the power of the gospel. I note in your syllabus that in India you had emancipation movements that were stimulated by Christianity against the caste system repeatedly. They happened in the first century, the sixth century, the 16th century, and the 19th centuries. Uh, that when Christianity came into India, it started a movement against the caste system and began to emancipate people. And it's done so today. Uh, Christianity remains a system in contradiction to the caste system in India. Uh, we need to then keep in mind that we as agents of the gospel are also to be agents of emancipation. Uh, I think I'll close on this particular point. And that is, as you keep in mind your role as a messenger of the gospel, we're always going to experience class systems. We're going to experience racial prejudice. We're going to experience ethnic conflicts. We bring a new gospel, a gospel of transformation and change. And that's really the gospel of emancipation. And that should be the good news that we bring to our relationships to one another and to the church as we establish it. With that, we'll close. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.